Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. So good to see all of you here. I assume you can see and hear me right now. Thank you, Claire Burr. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. Welcome back to the beautiful desert of eastern Utah. Welcome back to the earliest Cretaceous Cedar Mountain formation out here near the town of Moab. We're digging up some dinosaurs today, and I'm really glad you could be here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, in case it's your very first time here, or in case you're just very forgetful, let me reintroduce myself real quick. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. Now, you hopefully are already aware that a paleontologist is a scientist who studies fossils. Most paleontologists do not work on dinosaurs. I want to make that very clear from the beginning. Paleontology is not synonymous with dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are just the type of tip of the iceberg, you know. There are paleontologists who study everything from fossil bacteria to fossil whales, you know, from fossil trees to fossil plankton. If there was an ancient organism that's preserved in the fossil record, there's a paleontologist who studies it. Again, dinosaurs are just, you know, one small part of that. But dinosaurs are what I work on. Dinosaurs are what I talk about five days a week back home in my office, um, where we go over new fossil discoveries, talk about new publications, all that good stuff. But, uh... It's summertime, and during the summertime, dinosaur paleontologists, like me, are often out in the field collecting new fossils and uh, all the data associated with them, too, and that's what we're doing today. So I'm going to kind of walk you through that process. I've got a bone that I exposed earlier that we're going to be jacketing today, and I'll show you how that works. It's going to be pretty quick and short because it's a small bone, but it uh, should be instructive nonetheless. should be a fun stream, so I'm glad you're here again. Uh, and let's see... Uh, hello, hello, Indo, Claire Burr, Rachidactylus, Dinosaur Dave, uh, Pandora, Andrew Memrex, Data 500, Awkward Cyborg, uh, Maddie Mage, how are you all doing? It's good to have you here. Uh, the whole point of these broadcasts is, uh, science outreach, you know? This is the best method that I have of, of sharing what we do as paleontologists. Of not just telling you, but showing you how we do our work, and then opening it up for discussion. If you've got questions, if you've got things you're curious about, anything, you know, enthusiasm you'd like to share, it's all good. That's what the chat is for, and that's why these live broadcasts are so so special. This is why I like this so much more than like a static, state-installed YouTube video or something. We've got that live interactivity, which is uh, it's pretty special, I think. You know, it's nice to be able to have a heart-to-heart -heart about natural history about extinction and evolution and the fossil record and all that good stuff. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, if you've got any questions at all, please do not hesitate to ask. And... Uh, Case Allo says, is there any way to invite somebody to a stream? Oh yeah, absolutely. Just send them a link. You know? Uh, and it's like a live dinosaur documentary. There you go, Indo. Yeah, that's the idea, I hope. Uh... And when were their last trees there on the dig, says Andrew Memorex? Trees? You mean like where, when were there trees on this landscape? Oh boy, I don't know. This has been a desert for a while here out in Utah. Um, we do have some, some PJs up there, some pinion junipers. I don't know if you'd call those trees. They're more like big bushes. Um, not a lot of, not a lot of rainfall here. Not a lot of precipitation. And, uh... In the summer especially, but even during the winter, I hear they don't even get much snow here. As cold as it gets. Yeah. And, uh... Yeah. Dreamweaver says, is your hat special for your work? Now, this is a military surplus uh, sun helmet. So, U.S. Army issue, I think. Maybe U.S. Marines. But, turns out that this is just about the ideal head covering for this kind of weather. Um... Unlike a traditional hat, you know, that kind of like seals around your head, this has got a band in there, you know, like a helmet, almost like a hard hat or something, so that when there's the slightest bit of a breeze, the helmet is designed to kind of funnel that over the top of your head and wick away all the, all the sweat, so it works to keep me pretty cool out here. Um, I love it. Anytime I'm in a really hot climate doing field work, I'll be using this. Uh... That's why I wasn't in Wyoming, because it wasn't that hot. But here, you know, this is ideal. That's why Fisher's got one, too. His is U.S. Postal Service issue. 
from a former mail carrier. He got that as a graduation present. That's pretty cool. But, uh, yeah. And let's see. Do I know about the fourth trochanter? Did something happen to your fourth trochanter dinosaur, Dave? Oh, no. What? Are you talking about the caudofemoralis and muscle attachment? Um, Because, yeah, I could show you some of that here today. We've got a big, beautiful fourth trochanter on this iguanodontian femur that we're... uh, we're excavating. And... But yeah, let's see here. And Mama M Media, thank you for the raid. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Welcome back to our dinosaur dig. I'm digging with the Utah Geological Survey here. We've got what we think is a brand new species of Iguanodontian dinosaur. Think like Iguanodon, but 20 million years earlier. Or maybe think like Camptosaurus... But uh, five million years later, <laughs> something like that, you know. Yeah. And Jim is in the pit today, Pandora. Yeah, yeah. We'll go see him. And yeah. And let's see here. And Casey Snowart, thank you for being here. I appreciate you. It's good to see you. Yeah. And like a bulky Camptosaurus. Yeah, this would have been larger than. Well, I don't know. Camptosaurus does get pretty big. Uh, I don't know. We'll go down to the quarry. We'll talk to Jim about it, too. But yeah, good stuff. And thank you again, Mama M Media. Playing Ark today. Well, well, well. I hope you had fun. It's good to have you here. Welcome back to the site. Welcome back to the quarry. Uh, for anybody who's just joining us, maybe you're wondering, like, how in the world can you be broadcasting in such high fidelity from the middle of nowhere in the Utah desert? Well, this is how... Got a satellite this year, solar generator. So we are off the grid, yet we've still got high-speed internet. It's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty, pretty sweet setup, and pretty lucky to have this. So thank you to everybody who's made that possible through your support. And it's a big deal. Uh, and uh, oh, and by the way, before I forget, Claire Burr, thank you so much for making those uh, those short clips on uh, on YouTube. Could we maybe put those up as YouTube shorts or something? Because I feel like that would be awesome. Um, nice work on those. It's been, uh, it's good stuff. It's good stuff, Claire. Yeah. And yep, still using the live view encoder, Awkward Cyborg. You betcha. There it is right there. Yeah. Good stuff. And you can try to reformat them for shorts. Oh, shoot. Yeah, because they've got to be vertical. Huh. Well, if it's not too much work, that'd be cool, but if it is, don't worry about it. Um, I just appreciate that you've got those nice short ones on there. That's cool. Yeah. And... Good stuff. Yeah. Anyhow. Yeah. And yeah, if anybody's not aware, all of the, the VODs get put up on uh, YouTube. Uh, every day. So Claire Burr has actually been the one behind the wheel for that. So thank you again, Claire. Uh, so if you ever miss any of these and you like the YouTube platform, you can uh, check them out on YouTube. Yeah. Um, good stuff. Let me go get some water. And uh, of course, Claire, yeah, thank you again for your hard work. I appreciate it. Let's go down to the quarry. got two new crew members today, so I'll introduce you to them in a minute here. But, uh, yeah. Ethan's got a bunch of bones there. Fisher's got one that he's working on. Nice vert. And there, of course, is, uh, is Jim, too. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Kind of a nice, relaxing day in the quarry. It's not been, uh, hellishly hot. Only in, like, the high 90s today. Fahrenheit, thankfully. <laughs> but yeah. Uh. Mm. Let's see. And, and there you go, Carnotaurus. Yeah, it would be nice if I could put those on uh, the old Tink Tonk, too. We shall see. Pandora says, hi, crew. Hope you're all okay today. I'd say we are for the most part. Oh, yeah. We're yeah. alive. Yeah. <laughs> Hanging in there. Need that big bone. Uh, it's been a while. Yeah. Uh, 
that lovely pedestal you got going there, Fisher. All right, and uh, Clubber says, hi, Papa Jim. <laughs> so if anybody is, again, new to the channel, we've got with us uh, Utah's state paleontologist, Jim Kirkman here. So, uh, yeah, Jim's been digging dinosaurs on the Colorado Plateau for 51 years now. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. Having a few months all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Around the orb again. How many, how many dinosaurs would you say you've described from, from this part of the world so far, Jim? Like author on how many different new dinosaur We're publications? Ones right in the Cedar Mountain, maybe yeah. fifteen or sixteen. Fifteen or sixteen new yeah, dinosaurs exactly. just from this formation. From Spain and Mexico. Yeah. You know, new Mexico. You know, yeah. And a few others from other places. But this immediate area, mm -hmm. the majority of my stuff. I'm hoping to bring that number up to an even twenty for the Cedar Mountain. Twenty six nice. total. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good number. Yeah. Um. Pretty impressive. Yeah, and we've got Ethan and uh, Fisher here too. Uh, and then new in the quarry today, uh, we've got Maddie and Tegan who are here. Yeah. What's up, chat? <laughs> <laughs> you always wanted to say that? Yes. Yes, I have. <laughs> awesome. So they just arrived uh, around lunchtime today, and it's uh, it's good to have them here. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> Maddie, how long have you been doing paleo? Uh, for like 10 years now. Nice, so nice. I, I came out here in, I think, was it 2014, Jim, that I was out here? Yeah, it was quite a while ago. Yeah. <laughs> you were, how old were you then? I think I was like 14, so I think it was 2014. <laughs> nice, cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's good to have you here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good to be here. Yeah. What's up? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to dump her off with these weirdos. <laughs> that has life experience I'm like why did my mom drive four hours to just like dump me off in the desert for the day because <laughs> she's a good mom well, man I don't know I wish I could have done stuff like that when I was 14 yeah. I don't know well, I got to do some cool stuff but... um yeah anyhow so I've got a bone right here and sorry about the lighting yeah. it just happens to be in the uh, right in the and a beam of doom. The gap in the shade tarps up there. But this looks to me like maybe the proximal end of a rib or something. And so I'm gonna work on trenching around this and then we'll put a, uh, a cap on the top of it. A nice uh, gypsona cap. And I can walk you through that process. It's gonna be good. Yeah. And I know, right? I can. It's good to see you, I can. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> And Castle Dreamers is out here since 2014. Out here in this general area, like um, in this valley here. But this particular hole that we're digging in right now, we started back in 2022. So this is our third season in this quarry. And we've actually dug a fair amount here for the past three years. And when I say three years, I don't mean three calendar years. I mean, you know, three separate years we've been out here for like three weeks at a time. So I guess a total of about nine weeks, and uh, this is the extent of our excavation during that time, collectively. Yeah. And, but yeah, yeah. Anywho. <laughs> yeah, let me find a good place to put the camera. started. Oh, and as you can see, it is nice and cool today. Only 98 Fahrenheit. <laughs> um, and pretty humid too. Look at that. 10%. So, uh, really living it up. This is, uh, this is lovely.
MJ Build says, I know I said it before, but it's fun to see you and the crew in the field. Thank you. It's fun to be in the field. I'm glad, glad we could share that. So right now I'm going to trench around this. Get us into a good position where we can uh, stick a cap over it. Oh, and Lordy, how are you doing? It says, nice, cozy body temperature. Oh, yeah. You know? It's like that. Actually, a little bit cooler than body temperature. Wow. How lucky are we? 98.2. I'm going to hypothermia here. Of course, this is in the shade. It would be a lot warmer in the sun. Um, anyway, when I was, uh, I was trying to like square off this wall right here so we could wrap up work in this direction, and then I saw this little bit of bone sticking out there. I pulled this piece off, and said, oh, shoot, there's bone there. And so I was able to cut this back a bit and then dig down to expose what we've got going right here. But I need to collect this part too, because we've actually got chunks of bone that came off. We didn't have excellent separation here. So there's some bone here in the matrix. So what I'm going to do is wet some of this with some water to kind of you know, make it a little bit easier to work. I'm going to pull some chunks off of a smaller piece, we'll stick it on there, and then we'll put a gypsona cap over it once we get it trenched. So, uh, use some of this uh, noxious chemical right here, good old dihydrogen monoxide. And soften this part up so we can take it off. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Oh, that's way easier than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> nice. It's coming apart like butter. Like that basically. Maybe I can take some more of this off over here. Yeah. And I know you're joking there, Huckaboss. Not even wearing gloves? Handling that? Unbelievable. But we have a strict rule against using gloves in the quarry. Um, our other crew chief, uh, Don, is not a fan of using gloves in the quarry. It reduces your dexterity, makes it easier for you to mess things up. It's really important to be able to feel what's going on. Man, this is just coming apart so easy with that water. Nice. 
So I'm kind of just doing this for convenience sake, trying to break down this piece, because that's the only important part right there. As much of this as we can get rid of, that'll be nice so that we can stick it on top of there and make a smaller jacket. I don't want to get too aggressive with it. Oh, and there you go, Hakabas. I gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, the material safety data sheet for this doesn't say that we need hand protection. As we're gonna get here. So what I'm gonna do now is put some Vinac on here just to make sure that everything holds together. So this is not water, this is Acroloid B72. Kind of polyvinyl acetate glue. Just to make sure that this doesn't fall apart in transit. And then if they need to, they can reverse this in the lab by just putting some acetone over the top of it. Cool, so I'll let that dry right there, let it soak in. my little trench to make our cute little jacket.
Okay, that's looking pretty good so far. And it's really wobbling. So, let's get ready to uh, put a cap on this. Let me show you the bone one more time. Oop, up close. Before we put our protective jacket over it. Yeah, so, by the looks of it, this is a rib. Not the most important fossil, but, you know, who knows? Could offer some really important data. Um, maybe this is like a chunk that you might want to do some histo on or something. I don't know. But it's important to collect. So that's what we're going to do here. Here's that piece that came off when I originally found it. So I'm going to do my best to put this back on here. It should go on... More or less like uh let's see. What angle should this go on? Oh, there we go. Totally sure. I'll let them figure that out in the lab. So I'm just gonna jacket it like this. And here, let me let me try for another minute. So, this is a process that we're, I'm gonna show you really briefly. We're gonna make a small jacket here. But a jacket is this protective cocoon that we put around a fossil as we're digging it out of the ground. It's not like we put it in after we get it out of the ground. It's a, a part of the actual excavation process. So I'm gonna put a kind of a protective shell over this, made out of a little medical bandage. Uh, and then, once that cap is over the top, I can dig around it, dig under it, and we can flip it without it crumbling and falling apart. So I'll show you how that works. First thing we gotta do is get some separator. So I'm gonna grab some toilet paper for this.
All right. Got my toilet paper here. And so what I'm doing is applying a kind of a protective coating here to keep the plaster off of the bone itself. So we call this a layer of separator. Pretty self-explanatory, I think. So I wet the brush with some water, stick the toilet paper over the top, and then you use the wet paintbrush to kind of get the, the toilet paper to conform to all the nooks and crannies, all the little bits of topography on there. Pretty good. Cool. And now we can put one of those medical bandages over the top. Yeah. And just using that TP fish. Thank you. I'm gonna need it back. Well, I guess Danny's on a piss, yeah, so I'll just use it to <laughs> do my own. And uh, <laughs> Sparkly Miracle Zone, thank you for the raid. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Um, how did your stream go? Hope it went really well. Welcome to our uh, our dinosaur dig here. I am just about to put a field jacket, you know, a little cap over this uh, this bit of rib here. So let's do it. Grab the gypsona here. Pre-torn for you. What? This here? Go ahead and pay it. Okay, cool. Nice. Alright. So rather than do like a full burlap and plaster jacket for this, since it's just a little guy, we're using this, which is a pre-made medical bandage. Uh, the brand name is Gypsona. They named it that after gypsum, which is like one of the key components in plaster. So what I'm going to do here is yeah, it's just going to go over like that. We'll do a double layer. I'm going to roll this up, put it in some water, and that's what activates it. There we go, nice and wet. You get used to it. <laughs> All right. Nice. And I'll probably need actually a. It's gonna go as far as I thought it would. Might need a second layer. But we'll see.
wasn't quite enough, so grabbing a second one here and we'll open that up. using my fingers to make sure that I'm kind of getting rid of all, all those air pockets. It's a nice tight fit. It'll help protect this on its way back to the laboratory. You don't want it, anything rattling around in there. That nice. Do a probably full burlap and plaster for that one, right? Or you think you'd do the gypsum? I was leaning towards gypsum, but it's kind of on that threshold. Yeah, size. that's a tough call. Yeah, probably just at least one layer of gypsum, and then you could do full burlap later if you want. Yeah. Let's, go, let's get that started. Yeah. that to dry for a few minutes and then we can start trenching around it and uh yeah get ready to flip it and holy cow dapper dame thank you for the raid 104 raiders coming in all right while we're waiting for this to dry let me uh, go walk you around for a little bit Welcome to Paleontologizing, Raiders. I hope you had a wonderful stream, Dapper Dame, and welcome to a uh, beautiful, very dry, very hot desert of eastern Utah. We're out here digging dinosaurs. Uh, if it's your first time here, which for many of you it probably is, let me introduce myself real quick. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. Well, paleontologist is a fossil scientist. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular. Most paleontologists do not work on dinosaurs. I want to make that really clear. Don't want to come across as a dinosaur chauvinist or anything. Um, but yeah, we're out here digging up uh, what we think are the bones of a, a bunch of individuals of a new species of iguanodont dinosaur. Kind of like iguanodon, but about 20 million years earlier. And uh, we're digging up these fossils with the Utah Geological Survey, which is uh, uh, it's part of the Utah state government. And all of these fossils will be heading to the Natural History Museum of Utah in Salt Lake City. It's attached to the University of Utah. So uh, in a few years, you might even be able to see some of these on display, which would be pretty cool. But uh, yeah, let me know if you've got any questions. That's the, uh, the whole point of these streams, is to do science outreach, to walk you through the scientific process, to show instead of just telling, you know? But I'm happy to tell lots of stuff too. Just, you know, ask me some questions. Welcome. Uh, and uh, let's see. Lamp the Entertainer says, oh, dang, that's exciting. I know, right? Yeah. And 
And you collect fossils. A oh, very cool Dakota leader. Good to have you here. And do we have any vertebrae? We've got several. In fact, uh, Fisher's going to be jacketing a vertebra in just a minute. He's already in the process of doing that. Um, so we may have missed the beginning of it. We've got other vertebrae lying around, too. Uh, we've got almost a hundred bones of this animal that we've collected so far just this this summer in the past two weeks. Uh, we might get another hundred out, who knows, for the next like eight or nine days that we're here. Um, yeah. And then we've got, pff, I don't know how many hundred back in the laboratory already from the two previous field seasons that we've worked at this site. And uh, Hemi.B says, how do you already anticipate 20 million years early? Have you already carbon dated some samples? Radiometrically dated them, yes. Carbon dating doesn't actually work. Uh, like on rocks this old, because the half-life of carbon is too short. So it only works on more recent rocks. Um, but for these, we've got some good solid dates, I think for the lower yellow cat here. We'll talk to Jim about that. He'll know off the top of his head. But, uh, yeah, we clocked these rocks in at about 142 million years old. We will have some precise hard dates on that soon, but right now our sort of rough estimate is about 142, which is pretty cool. Uh, and let's see here. A carbon is too short half of exactly Emmy dot B, yeah. So here I think you might use argon-argon or potassium-argon dating. We'll ask Jim. Uh, looking at some of the zircons. And Dapper Dame, how was your stream? I hope it was really good. Thank you again for the raid. Um, you were playing some Stardew Valley? That's, uh, that's good stuff. I hear there are dinosaurs in that game. Are there not? Dinosaur fossils? Can I ask what jacketing is? You bet, Dapper Dame. So, here, I'll, I'll show you. Um, when we're digging these bones out of the ground, since they are so very old, and since they are so socked in there, they're in this, you know, mudstone, it's not like you can just lift the bones out of the ground. It doesn't work that way. Um, these have been fossilized. They're, they tend to be very delicate. You know, they'll just fall apart. They'll crumble if you try and pick them up. So what we have to do is build a protective cocoon over the top side of them. And then we dig around that. And then if you've built the cocoon well enough, the, the jacket, you can flip it without the thing crumbling. And then you jacket the underside. So you just have the thing fully enveloped. I'll show you, you know. Uh, there we go. This is what Fisher's working on right here. So he's got a vertebra right there. And uh, he's applying a layer of separator. Some toilet paper there. And uh, so that'll keep the plaster from sticking directly to the bone. That's a nice layer of separation there. Uh, and then I'll have some of these... I think he's going to be using gypsona, so these, like, pre-made medical bandages. Um, since this is a smaller bone. For a larger one, like uh, this big femur that Ethan's working on over here, this is going to require some full-on plaster and burlap to make a jacket. Uh, yeah. So, do we have any of those unfinished jackets? Like a half jacket? Oh, yeah, we've got one right here. Yeah, big one. Yeah. yeah so this is the underside after it's been flipped. And, uh, yeah, we'll have to put Please. a... Yeah, it's, it's, that wouldn't be bad if someone did that. Yeah, we can do that later. today. Yeah. In fact, I can probably do that once I get this thing out. There's not a lot more digging I can do over there. Yeah. So, yeah, we can do that today. Yeah. Anyway, good stuff. And you should go for toilet paper sponsors that will want in on all the dinosaur yeah. action. We've thought about it. <laughs> Northern works really well. What does? Northern. Northern. Quilted yeah. Northern? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It doesn't tear when you don't want it to tear quite as much. Some just, they just, you're trying to wrap something and it just uh -huh. falls apart in your hands. Yeah. It's as frustrating as anything. I know the paleobotanists like to use the non perforated kind. So it's just, you know. Yeah, so it doesn't do that. Yeah, yeah. But they do a lot more wrapping than we do. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Ethan, you guys, you have TP and it's your gypsum and TP nearby. And what's the best ply area, count for jacketing? It depends, nice. you know. Yeah, no super rush, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get this in about five. Okay. Yeah. So I'm Ethan is going to be on this. applying a gypsum of these pre-made medical bandages on top of that. A little pop jacket here. There 
Miguel. And that's how it's done. So he's using his fingers to kind of press in all those nooks and crannies, get it to conform to the that very irregular shape. Yeah. And Pry Pry wants to know how do we get the fossils out of the jacket, finally? Yeah, well when we get these back to the laboratory, you saw them open and uh Use various tools to chip away the rock. Use a lot of consolidant, a lot of glue to make sure that the fossil doesn't fall apart. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty pretty simple. Uh, it does require a lot of skill though. Like fossil preparation is one of those things that it's absolutely essential. Like we wouldn't have fossils to study if we didn't have fossil preparators cleaning them. And a lot of paleontologists, you know, have a background in fossil preparation. Like that's how a lot of a lot of the best-known paleontologists got their st got their start in fossil prep. People like Jack Horner. Well, it's often the first thing they'll pay you to, yeah. to do as uh -huh. a grad student. <laughs> yeah. And how was this dig site discovered? Well, shoot, Jim could probably tell you about that real quick. I don't know how quick it will be. <laughs> <laughs> or I could do it if you're busy, Jim. No, no, no. Yeah. I just warning you yeah <laughs> <laughs> so here for anybody new all the raiders who just came in this is utah's official state paleontologist jim kirkland with the utah geological survey yeah well anyway soon after we found the, the utah raptor in 1989 1990 mm -hmm. and knew we had some good over there um you know, we're looking at the maps, you know, we're prospecting that area and find more stuff on Nick Colbertia on the other side of the hill. Mm -hmm. You know, the most primitive North American ornithomimid at this point. <clears throat> so looking at, you know, maps and, and things, we, you know, I got a hold of Helmut Doling, at, uh, he was a geologist at the Utah Geologic Survey. And I was working out of Colorado, I said, you have, I, I understand you're mapping Arches National Park in vicinity. Mm -hmm. Do you have any maps of this area? And uh, a couple weeks later, I got this big manila envelope. <laughs> and in it were about 20 sheets of 8.5 by 10 paper, you know, color Xeroxes, uh -huh. taped together meticulously <laughs> of the entire area. So you just put this beautiful big map together. Pencil, you know, yeah. pencil colored, you know, zero, color Xerox yeah, yeah. of his maps. You know, he put it, spliced it all together for me. And I looked at this area and said, Whoa, there's this big round circle that's mapped as Morrison. Uh -huh. I bet there's some of that lower part of the Cedar Mountain over there. Nice. So I found there was a road coming in, came in, looked, uh, found teeth of iguanodonts, ossicles, and ankylosaurs, uh -huh. sauropod teeth, theropod teeth, found a variety of things. And I, at the time, we were marking the base of the Cedar Mountain on this big carbonate paleosaur. Uh -huh. So this was, you know, just above these chart beds, uh, silica, not carbonate. And I thought, well, maybe they're silicified, you know, the carbonates. And I thought it was the same level we were finding Ned Colberti on uh, sure. over there, yeah. since it was a widespread lag of material as well. And uh, a few years later, 2005, we had been led into a site we were working on right by the road in between. Mm -hmm. And um, we're working on this site. We had a student from India working with us. Uh, you know, he was looking at the soils over there. And I'm starting to look at these chert beds there and the carbonate above them. And, you know, and drive over here, chert beds here, carbonate above them, all our bones above the chert bed. The carbonate's supposed to be the bottom of the yellow cat. Uh -huh. This isn't Morrison, because I was convinced that was the base of Morrison. Sure. Sorry, top yeah. of the Morrison, that calcrete. So I did five trips back and forth uh -huh. that day. Oops. Oh, goodness. I can go... Uh... Almost failed. <laughs> uh, we, I can live for a few minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we came back and forth. Then I came back with Don and Scott Madsen. Uh -huh. You know, we're looking at the, the tooth area, and they go out prospecting. I find a ankylosaur plate coming out. Huh. So I was gonna, I'm working on that. And they go around the basin don't find, you know, anything really on yeah. the edges. You know, looking at stuff come down the slopes. Mm -hmm. um, and they come back over, and I've got this thing pretty much uncovered, but i still got an hour's work or so at least to do sure. on it. 
And they stand there tapping their feet. And, no, we can't stand here. Neither of them <laughs> like to stand around, do nothing. Yeah. So they take off. Oh, we'll look some more. Hey, Jim. Trips out. TP. Yeah. All right. Uh, they don't like to work, you know, stand around. So they went back and looking, and they're bound here, uh -huh. you know, in this back wall area. And they start walking. Oh, okay, let's go back there. We didn't find anything. Scott comes walking across this area, dawn about a hundred meters further south. Yeah. About the same time, they both found bone. Scott found bone right over there. <laughs> On that little bench, uh -huh. at Scott's place, and down by the road, the other side of the road, Don found some bones coming out. And that turned out to be the holotype of Yorgovuchia, huh. a small dromaeosaur that we described from here. Uh, but they worked there for an hour or so and covered so. Oh, okay, this looks good. They both stand up and ran, you know, figuring, okay, we better go tell Jim about this. Yeah, stand up, turn toward each other just randomly, and realize they're about a hundred meters, a bit more apart. On the same bed, <laughs> you know, we had found a big site. Yeah, <laughs> and they came over. We came back over. We started explaining. There's bones coming out, but it's in the middle of the flats, as you can right, see. Right, which is weird. Yeah, so yeah. it's like you know, normally you find these things on, on the side slopes, of the hill. Yeah, yeah, coming yeah. down. Uh huh. But this stuff, because of the way the creeks are cutting in, and this site covers almost the whole floor of the basin. Uh huh. So it's a giant site. Stuff is richer in some areas. Sometimes it's not so well preserved. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's three different levels in one place. It's a complicated, wet, marshy environment, but it's it's loaded with fossils. And now, you know, at first we thought it was similar in age, and some people still think this, uh, yeah. with the upper yellow cat mm -hmm. fauna, the Utah raptor proper fauna. But the sauropod's different. A number of the animals are clearly different. Uh, Karen Poole's working on this iguanodont, you know, is she's convinced that it and the next one up are different species, but are probably related uh -huh. to each other. And there's a, I think there's a gap at that calcrete huh. between these levels. And we're pretty convinced this is the oldest multi-generic dinosaur bone bed <laughs> in the Cretaceous of the Northern Hemisphere. Right. Pretty which, important. Which just yes, like yeah. boosts its importance. Yeah. Everything we're finding is new. We got parts of a therizinosaur, a big you know, acrocanthosaur-sized carnosaur. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the dromaeosaur, you know, a turiosaur, sauropod, tur that we named murosaurs, Bob Young Eye, uh, new ankylosaur, and this, you know, most, the most common animal, uh, just getting serious work on it, is mm -hmm. this iguanodont stuff. Yeah. Which is through the whole site. But you dig iguanodonts and you find other things too. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Let me let me work on fixing that shade tarp too, because it's. Yeah, you, you know, want the nail? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, at least yeah. it hit me point first in the head. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I keep getting worried about one of those whipping across the forest. <sighs> I'm gonna do my best to tie it down with an tight, extra yeah, rope do so tight. it doesn't. Because uh, do we've tight. got it tension in two different directions. So uh, just set the camera down and go do that. like this and go, oh, it's a nugget. Yeah, but this could be complete surface. It probably could well be a tarsal. Yeah. Tarsals are pretty nice strips. That's almost bedding this tarsal.
hot top. Well, that's my cold ice water. Be done with this in a minute. Oh, oh, <clears throat> the only work on dinosaurs because no one else has. <laughs> Do it. There we go. Appreciate your patience there. Whoop. Thank you much, man. Yeah, you bet, Jim. Bet, Jim. Get some water. Uh. Ooh, as you can see, Fisher is. Applied some of those gypsonas to oh, this. Nice medical bandages to make a nice cap. It's done the same over there. Things move pretty fast here. Uh, and what day was the sit down with Karen chat? I think that was like last Saturday or something. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It was like yet last year at this point. And. Yeah, and how hot is it out there today? That's pretty cool today. You know, 97.5 in the shade. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just a hair under body temperature. I know, right? I'm gonna have to go get a coat or something. Drink some hot chocolate in the quarry. Yeah, and chicken bacon Swiss. A, a piece of dinosaur tail with feathers on it. I think that was actually, did that turn out to be a, was that a bird tail? I think it was, which is still a dinosaur. It's a therapod. But uh, yeah, I forget the, I think it was definitely not a hoax, if that's what you're asking. No. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> but yeah, I think, uh, was it Jingmei O'Connor who published on that? Or that was Oculo Dentavis, that was that purported, uh, uh, bird head trapped in amber that turned out to be a lizard. <laughs> lizard head, obviously. But yeah. Mm. Okay. I think the plan is get this thing out, trench around it, flip it, put a slip on the bottom, and then we'll do a uh, bottom jacket on the, uh, that big limb bone over there that Jim was talking about. And, and Asteria Marie says, would you ever do some digging in Scotland or any other sites around the world? Absolutely, yeah. I've only done field work in the U.S. so far, but that yes. might change sometime soon. Um, I've got some contacts in other parts of the world now, and send Danny to Mongolia. I'd love to go to Mongolia. Yeah, shoot, Mongolia, Patagonia, Antarctica. Yeah, bet you it's a little bit, a little bit colder there than it is here right now. 
Antarctica actually sounds really nice right now. I could go for some Antarctica. LSS, why was it T-Rex had feathers? I mean, we do know that some kinds of Tyrannosaurus had feathers. We're not sure about Tyrannosaurus in particular, but we do know that other members of that broader family, things like Dai Long and Guan Long and Yu Tyrannus, we know that they had feathers. So I suspect that Tyrannosaurus probably did too, at least during a certain stages of its life, maybe when it's really young. It would have had feathers. Think about like how a uh, like an Asian elephant, the baby ones can be kind of hairy, and then they tend to lose a lot of that as they grow and develop. Wouldn't be shocked if it's the same way with T-Rex, and kind of simple filamentous feathers. Um, but yeah, yeah, and as for like body mass of dinosaurs, we do have a pretty good sense that a lot of the, I don't know, like general mass of dinosaurs would have hewn pretty close to their skeletal silhouette. Because we found, you know, mummified specimens of duckbill dinosaurs. And there have not been too many surprises there for the most part. Like it seems like their their body silhouette pretty closely matches their skeletal silhouette. So it's not quite like mammals where they do all kinds of crazy crazy stuff like that. Dinosaurs would be as you would imagine, kind of closer to birds and crocodilians. Their modern extant phylogenetic bracket. But I'm sure there's some surprises, some surprises in there too. But it's not like, you know, uh, maybe you're talking about that illustration that people pass around online of like a, a brachiosaur skeleton and they draw a silhouette, silhouette around it to make it look like a penguin or something. Like you like that one? Yeah. It's, uh, it's amusing, but it's not... <laughs> I don't know. I don't think it's very likely. No, considering how Exactly, it'd be nuts. Yeah. And generally, the bigger a dinosaur is, like, the more they kind of need to conserve weight. That's why many of these big uh, Cerishian dinosaurs, in particular, your theropods and your sauropods, a lot of them have highly pneumatized skeletons, so they're all full of air sacs and um, pneumatic spaces and stuff like that. So yeah, I don't think I don't think those like super chunky dinosaur illustrations are all that all that close to reality. considered that the sauropods and the theropods are more closely related than the ornithischians. Oh yeah, there's the ornithoscalida hypothesis yeah. that... Yeah, so I... I don't know, I don't really work in dinosaur phylogeny that much. Gotcha. Um, so I don't really have a horse in that fight, but yeah. everybody I've asked the same question to recently, they're like, yeah, that was kind of a flash in the pan kind of a thing, where like, <laughs> there was like a couple of weird phylogenies that they came up with <laughs> that put theropods and uh, ornithischians together. together, and it's like you ch change a few of those characters and the whole thing falls apart. Yeah. So gotcha. it seems like that's we're probably not going to see a major shakeup yeah. there. But it was an interesting idea, but like yeah, I don't think it's really gone anywhere. Because what I was hearing yeah. is that because there's so few ornithischian tri or not triceratops Ornithischian yeah. Triassic fossils. Oh yeah, yeah. And they only show up at the very end of very early Jurassic. Yep. It's hard to. Yeah. yeah. It's tricky. Now we, 
some paleontologists are starting to think that um, that silosaurs, these weird like, do you know what they are? They're like, they, they're close to dinosaurs, but they've always been considered like, uh, just right outside. Just right outside. So like, they're non-dinosaur dinosauromorphs. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. They might actually be the first ornithischians. Oh. Okay. And so they might actually be true dinosaurs. And ah. so the jury's still kind of out on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I have, I have seen that hypothesis thrown around a lot more recently. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the general consensus might be moving in that direction. We'll awesome. see. Because yeah. so, yeah. it was that, I don't know, a long time ago it was that it was the sauropods and ornithischians were together. And then the yeah, phytodinosauria, yeah. I think the group is called. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. It's weird. Like, we don't have enough of the Triassic stuff right at the base mm -hmm. to be able to, like, really tell what's going on yeah and then right as, right as they're all separating they're all so similar anyways, exactly it's really difficult. yeah yeah so yeah good question yeah i just wanted to yeah. know your thoughts on it <laughs> i appreciate what that what i yeah. like about the uh ornithoscolida uh, like, yeah because theoretically that means sauropod right yeah yeah <laughs> well, in the paper, they just declare they're dinosaurs still. Uh huh. Well, is that all you need to do? <laughs> <laughs> I remember Denver Fowler teasing Kerry Woodruff about that. He's like, like, oh, your sauropods, they're not dinosaurs anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there you go, yeah. 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 That's a good way to put it. Yeah, I mean, um, just can't wish it so. I mean, right. Yeah. Original definition of dinosaurs did not include sauropods. <laughs> I suppose it didn't, yeah. Was Cediosaurus known that far back or was that later? Uh, later, and, and then, you know, dinosaurs were based on Iguanodon, Megalosaurus, and Hylaeosaurus. Yeah, yeah, the original three. Uh, yeah. Huh. Well, that's still Ornithischia and Sauricia, though. You know. Well, but if sauropods aren't Sauricia. Exactly. You know, yeah. I mean, if they're outside that glade, uh huh. And, you know, it just creates. You know, I mean, for a long time, people were saying Ornithischia and Sauricia were separate. Yeah, the yeah. The dinosaur was, was a. Glade, yeah, yeah. Know? So this thing is kind of throwing that kind of thing up for grabs again. Huh. You know? Oh, I got to go fix that tarp again. One of my knots didn't come out the way it was supposed to. Given, have, it, have we found any dinosaurs that may have given live birth versus laying eggs? And how could you tell something like that? Um, so for a while, there were still a few dinosaur groups that we didn't have any eggs from. Um, we didn't have any from 
any marginocephalian dinosaurs, so that's like ceratopsians and pachycephalosaurs. Um, and that was until, I think, 2020. Finally, they announced the ceratopsian egg, and it turns out these guys may have had soft-shelled eggs, and that's probably why the eggs seem to be so rare. They're just more difficult to fossilize, because they don't have that, you know, the, the hard parts to start with. And so we've got basically all of our major dinosaur groups, we've got eggs from each one of them. So as far as we know, there are no dinosaurs that gave birth to live young. Like, all, the, all species of dinosaurs would have laid eggs as far as we know. Um, which again, isn't surprising when you look at dinosaurs' modern relatives. You've got birds, who are literally living dinosaurs. Um, and they all lay eggs. And then you've got crocodilians, the only other surviving archosaurs. Uh, the group of reptiles that dinosaurs belong to. And uh, they all lay eggs, too. So, you know, there's nothing in dinosaurs' extant phylogenetic bracket that would predict live birth, you know. Uh, it would suggest that dinosaurs did that, so we've really got no reason to think that any dinosaurs gave live birth at this point. That could change, you know. If you ever found, a, like, an embryo inside of a, a mother dinosaur... But so far, the only times that's happened, you know, they've been inside of eggs. Yeah. Good question. Uh, get this thing out of here. Oh, and that is about ready to flip. Hey, can I get that TV back? Thank you. All right, lovely. So, there is our rib. Just flip that. I'm going to clear away a little bit of this rock. Just a tiny bit. And then, uh... Put a bottom on this thing. Then I'll get it mapped and logged, and then I can work on putting a, a bottom on that other jacket too. Yeah, there we go. So there's the bottom of that rib poking out right there, so I know I've cut this down as far as I should. So I'm going to put a little bit more paper towel on this, and then uh, another few gypsona strips, and we're golden. Let's get some glue on this guy first. There we go. Nazun says, would a fossilized egg from an ovoviviparous animal be distinguishable from a regular egg? It would be in the sense that it would probably be kind of leathery, um, I think, or at least soft. I don't think there are any ovoviviparous animals, animals that hatch their eggs inside them that have hard-shelled eggs. I'm trying to think of any any uh, exceptions. I, I can't think of any, yeah. Yeah, like... snakes. Yeah. Yep. Most snakes are Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's various kinds of lizards. There's one called a viviparous lizard, and I I don't know if they actually develop eggshell or if it's just if they skip that step. Yeah. Um, there is a fossil example, a purported fossil example, of an ovoviviparous reptile of its egg. There is a specimen found in Antarctica that they called the thing. <laughs> it was supposed to be a mosasaur egg. So the idea was that like mosasaurs would be, uh, they'd be ovoviviparous. So like the eggs would develop inside and then uh, they would hatch inside, the young would swim out and then the mother just like ejects the empty eggshell. Um, pliosaurs too. Pliosaurs too? Yeah, ovoviviparous? Yeah, oh, but did they have uh, like an eggshell for them or no? Well, they're almost certainly being born in, in you know, developing inside. Right. And probably in a, you know, a sack of some sort. Of yeah. Now, I was yeah. talking with uh, Takuya Konishi, the Mosasaur expert, and when we were out in Wyoming together, and uh, he's like, he doesn't buy the whole Mosasaur 
eggshell thing. He's like, I don't think that's what that is. Maybe they were doing that, but he's like, that's not what that fossil shows. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> It's important to get different perspectives on these things, I guess. I don't work on Mosasaurs, so like, I'm not an expert on this. It would make sense in a Mosasaur because they're so closely related to, uh, to lizards. And, to, yeah, and they are yeah, lizards. exactly, yeah. So, so it's not a stretch at all to imagine them doing that, for sure. Yeah, and they they certainly were giving birth to live young, but like, was that thing actually a Mosasaur egg? Takuya says definitely not. So, yeah. But yeah. And <laughs> Dinodonchin, that's uh, that's Don there. Uncle Don says hello to Maddie. Uh, Don, hello. Yeah. <laughs> Come back to Dolings Bowl, please. Yeah, you should be back on Saturday. Oh shoot, you're leaving before then. He planned on on purpose. Oh darn. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's really good to have uh, have Maddie and Tegan here. Yeah, yeah. I like it. And, uh, and Lenina, thank you for, for gifting Don a subscription. He won't have to see any ads. Don said very pointedly, he's like, I'm not, not going to watch it all because I don't want to watch you guys mess things up in the quarry while I'm gone. So, the joke's on you, Don. Now you're watching. <laughs> oh, shoot. You want to show him? I actually don't, so. Oh, okay. I just know he doesn't like it when I just plaster on my shoes. Really? It's funny. Yeah. Uh, Don says, sorry to miss you. Uh. Uh, sure. <laughs> sure uh. Anyway, it's good to see you, Don. Thanks for going on that wild goose chase earlier, looking for those those casts. Um, yeah, hopefully it's not too much trouble to pick them up in, uh, in price on the way here, because that would definitely help me out a lot. But... It's not the end of the world if we have to ship them. Uh, and Don says, don't worry, I won't watch long, wink. <laughs> yeah, get back to work, Don. <laughs> no, seriously, Don, it's good to see you. Um, I hope your, uh, your trip home has been nice. Too bad that my femur was Enjoying uh, being back in civilization for a while. All right, it's nice and dry. Let's put a bottom on this thing. <laughs> Shouldn't have used tinfoil. So, we've got a half jacket so far. Uh, this is the top. Under here, we flipped it over. So we're going to put a bottom slip on. Uh, bottom lid, whatever you want to call it. Actually, gonna need this much TP, probably. I don't know. We'll see. Might make a little lip around the perimeter, make it easier to cut. Hold that over like that. A little brush. And put some separator on here. Dabbing this down with the wet paintbrush. Okay. And now what I'm going to do is a little trick I learned at Museum of the Rockies. I'm gonna roll this lengthwise like this. And then you just put it around the perimeter. Almost like a miniature pool noodle or something. And make it easier to cut when it gets back to the lab. Uh, 
chicken bacon splits. We do a no acrylate super glue on things, but it's kind of more more rare. It's the exception to the rule. Um, we don't we hardly ever put it on the actual fossils themselves. That's kind of bad practice. But we will use it to. To some people. Yeah. I there are, there are preps that Scott says impossible without. Them. Yeah. Impossible. Denver used to say the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So never, never say never. <laughs> Unless it's Our an oyster works knife. This is what we use. <laughs> perimeter right here and now let's uh, get this with another gypsona. I know, Don. <laughs> uh. <laughs> well, Don, you'll be pleased to know that I'm still not using any oyster knives at the quarry, even with you gone. Uh, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't dream of it. Some lucky volunteer is going to get to open up this little gift in the lab. Let's find a little rib inside. again. Smooth all those seams so nothing comes apart. Clean 
my hands off with some dust. says only fossils I've ever found have been ammonites and trilobites inside shale deposits cool I mean that's that's neat and if they're invertebrate fossils then generally they are cool to collect um, even if you're on public land but if you're talking about animals with backbones and you're on public land then you need permits to collect those like we've got here in this quarry um, anyway I do think it's it's cool to be able to like, you know, dig up invertebrates like that and take them home and hold a piece of Earth's history in your hand. And it's, it's a pretty neat feeling. I'm glad you've been able to do that. Welcome, Elite. It's good to have you here. I can loan it to you. I can pour you some in a minute. There's a pipe in there. You don't find much of those out, outside of those in Scotland? It's true, yeah. you got to go up to like the Isle of Skye. Um, I think that's the only place where... Uh, big vertebrate fossils have been discovered, at least from the Mesozoic in Scotland. You've probably got Pleistocene stuff, stuff from like the last ice age there too, I'd imagine. There's probably some Pleistocene alluvium in Scotland. What do you think, Fisher? Uh, I mean, if it wasn't covered by ice sheets, then yeah. Oh, oh shoot, yeah. Great stuff in Scotland. Yep. You know, the old red sandstone, Devonian, amazing. Oh, really? Isle of Skye, uh -huh. little Jurassic, some of the best in the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, some lovely pterosaurs from there. I think the biggest pterosaur we have from the Victoria Gardens, Jurassic is. <coughs> in Glasgow, discovered by my great grandfather and some other workers. Yeah. Uh, where they had the, the standing forest of Calamites. Oh, nice. And he actually made the wrought iron baskets in the old antique poster. <laughs> yeah. My Scottish roots go back in the fair of the <laughs> So you definitely do have some cool stuff in Scotland. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, the that now, we've been having some fun chats. <laughs> Isn't Arthropora from Scotland? Is it? I think so. Big old millipede guy from the Carboniferous? Yeah, it could be. Huh. Somebody look that up. Arthropora, is it from Scotland? I've got a vague recollection that some of the founders of geology were from Scotland. Oh, yeah. Was that William Strata Smith? No, he's British, but I think Hopkins was Scottish. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Now, there's some great geologists from Scotland. <laughs> and yeah, there we go. Thank you, Claire Burr. Arthur Pleura lived in North America and Scotland during the late Carboniferous. Pennsylvanian. Yeah. Nice. And I think Cassie Gerinus might be from there as well. Another huh. Carboniferous taxon. Hmm. Oh, and Diplocallus as well. Diplocallus is from Scotland? I think so. From the Permian? Permian and late Carboniferous, I think. Huh. That'd be pretty cool. An old boomerang headed amphibian. label this once it's done drying, but let me uh, get ready to put that on the map. Um, yeah, let's see if we can put it right here. And our nail is over here somewhere.
Oh, there it is. Lovely. Centimeters. And that one there. Put that. Two, four, five, six. Chat. I know we talked about this yesterday, but uh, for anybody who wasn't here yesterday, let me kind of reintroduce this, or let me tell you about this. It's a reintroduction for everybody who was here yesterday. And every time we collect a fossil from here, we, uh, we make sure that it's mapped and logged. So this is this particular grid square for this area right here. We've got these nails that we've put down in a grid pattern here. Um, and these are you know, consistent year to year. So the grid never moves around, it stays in place. So that, you know, no matter how, dig we, how, how deep we dig, we can always make sure that everything lines up properly. Um, the stuff from previous years that may have been at higher levels, uh, we can correlate that to stuff from this year. Even if it's deeper down, we've still got that same grid pattern. We could just superimpose it over it. So I pulled this rib out of right here. So I figured where this is on the map, measured it up from that uh, from that point, and then I've got coordinates so I can put it onto the specimen log. So this is number 38. That's a lot of specimens. All right, and let's see. Three point six. And someone have the clipboard. I've got him here. Oh, you're writing on it currently, huh? Yeah. Oh, good. I'll, I'll, I'll come back in a few. I should be done in just a minute. Thank you. Okay. Got six bones up? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, looking good. I went for it. Here you go, Ethan. DC Chemix says, I noticed that you often rock the quintessential explorer hat and khaki combo. Uh, is that a stream thing, or do you just like looking the part? I mean, I wear this because it works in the field. I don't know. I've been, I've been doing field work, digging dinosaurs and other fossils almost every summer since 2011. And uh, I don't know. I find that this just really works well. 
shorts are essential for me because, I don't know, if I wear long pants, I will overheat really quickly. Um, so, yeah, good sturdy, sturdy boots are really important. I've got, these are like hunting boots. Um, might be kind of ironic for a vegetarian to be wearing hunting boots, but they're really, really good for hunting dinosaurs too. And them being so tall helps protect me against, I don't know, like rattlesnake bites and turned ankles and stuff like that. So I like these boots a lot. Um, a lot of the shirts that I wear are military surplus because they're cheap and they're uh, pretty durable and they hide dirt well too. So even if I can't do laundry for a while, you know, they don't look absolutely filthy in the way that other shirts might. And then the sun helmet is military surplus, and I only wear this when it's really, really hot out. So I'll wear other hats. Hats are important in the field to keep the sun off of you, keep you from overheating, and that's precisely what this does. So it's designed in such a way that, you know, this band right here kind of keeps your, keeps the helmet away from, you know, from your head. And so there's a layer of air in between. So anytime there's even the slightest breeze, this kind of funnels it up and over the top of your head. And it's, it's kind of like air conditioning. So, you know, it doesn't just look the part. This is actually a really practical piece of equipment. Um, and Fisher's got one too, but his is, uh, you might see it back there on his backpack. His is from the U.S. Postal Service. You know, there's a reason that mail carriers will wear these in really hot climates. And it's not for fashion reasons. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like the best thing that you can wear when it's really, really hot out. Yeah, I hope that makes sense. Uh, mm -hmm. It both makes sense and looks awesome. Thank you, I'm glad it doesn't look too outlandish. <laughs> I promise it's very practical. Yeah. Let's work on uh, getting a, a bottom on that big jacket over there. Be good to finally get that done. I'm not sure how long it's waited at this point. But let's see. I guess I can just set the camera over here. Okay, good. Yeah, that one's super important. So, chat, you saw me do a small jacket earlier. Very small. You can see a larger one now. Uh, with the burlap and plaster and the whole shebang. So right now I'm just getting rid of some of the debris on top so that the separator sticks a little bit better. You want to get all the loose crud off. Get nice adhesion. It's, it's ironic. You want good adhesion of the separator. <laughs> but, yeah. You'll see. Right. Like that. 
so you can see. Okay. Clear the perimeter. There's gonna be plaster flying around. Yeah, let's get stuff together. Mind if I use this, Fisher? Go ahead. All right. Water into here. I found a good tamping brush because I don't want to use my good. Hog airbrush for that. that way over here. Do you want this brush? Perfect. Yeah, cool. thanks, Patty. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay. And Andrew Memorex says, have the tools paleontologists use changed that much in the past hundred years? Um, you can probably guess the answer is no, for the most part. <laughs> yeah. um, when people like Othniel Charles Marsh and Edward Drinker Cope were sending crews out to the American West back in the 1870s and 1880s, they were using a lot of these same tools, paintbrushes, chisels, hammers. They originally uh, devised the plaster and burlap method, the jacketing method of getting fossils out of the ground. So a right. lot of field work has not changed much in you the past hundred years. Yeah. Uh, but we do have other things now. We've got internal combustion engines, bring vehicles out here, makes our lives a lot easier. We've got GPS, um, digital photography, stuff like that. Um, and some crews are even starting to use, you know, like scanning technology, whether it's you know, sometimes LIDAR for surface scanning, quarries and stuff like that, or uh, photogrammetry for making like a, you know, a 3D model of uh, what a site looks like. But that's kind of surface level stuff. The, the nuts and bolts of, of how we dig fossils hasn't really changed much at all in the past like 150 years almost. It's hard to improve something that yeah, perfection, you know? Yeah, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know? But the five points are unique to every port. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Everything is kind of case by case. Certain methods that work for <laughs> one quarry will not work for another quarry. It can't be dogmatic as a paleontologist, especially in the field. But uh, you want to walk away with some high quality data. Oh, yeah. And Darius Majewski says, what does the TP do? Just a layer between the fossil and the plaster? Bingo. Yeah. I call this the separator. Guess what it does? <laughs> so this is just so that you don't get plaster sticking to the bone, or even sticking to the rock. That could be a pain too.
brush, Maddie. Can I throw it back to you? Good catch. All right. Um, now I'm gonna measure out how much burlap I need for this. seen our burlap shears? One of the tubs. Hmm. You would hope. <laughs> Spent like nine dollars on those. There they are. Yeah. actually something I bought this year that I've always wanted to have in the field and for some reason just never got. Um, but fabric shears, really cheapo ones. It's okay if they get messed up, but should be making, uh, it should make uh, cutting the burlap out a breeze. So let's do that. Too much time with like a rusty combat knife. It's really, really dull trying to cut through burlap. There's got to be a better way. <laughs> Might look cooler, but. Not sure which one I like better. No, I was actually really proud of myself. I went and got a tetanus booster before I came out here. Nice. Uh, I had the presence of mind to go do that before going out to the field in June. Yeah, it wasn't that bad actually. Really? I can't remember the last time I got one. It'd probably been at least ten years. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you can't remember when it was. Probably do. Yep. <laughs> This, and then I'll cut a second one. So I'm gonna do it two layers.
Okay. So here comes a crucial step, and that is determining how much water to pour into the bucket, because that'll determine how much plaster we make. And for two big strips, let's see. up, get a nice kind of even consistency in here, break up all those like dry chunks of plaster, get it all nice and smooth, and since it is so hot out today, this stuff is going to set up pretty fast, especially as thick as I've mixed it. different schools of thought on how thick you should mix the plaster and whether or not you should soak your burlap strips in water beforehand. This is the way that I was trained to do it with the Museum of the Rockies, so it's kind of the way I'm comfortable with doing it. Um, I don't know, if I don't soak the strips, I'm kind of afraid I'd mix the wrong amount of plaster and just kind of mess everything up, so I'm doing, doing it the way I'm accustomed to doing it. And, uh, no, let's do it. Should be my narrower strip. There we go. Last week you, were right. <laughs> you do, Jim. There's more than one way to shave a cat, though. to skinning a cat, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're a good cat. <laughs> You're a <good> <laughs> Alright. Here we go. I gotta make sure that when I put this on, I don't take it back off, because it'll take the separator with it. We don't want that, so we gotta be decisive about it. And there we go. crannies, get rid of all those air pockets.
wondering if the microphone is picking up all the squelching noises because I know for some reason it's just it really likes that frequency or whatever. <laughs> it always sounds much louder in the recording than it does in real life. Okay. And strip two of two right here. plaster on both sides of the burlap. It looks like I've made just the right amount. Yeah, almost none to spare. part of paleo. Yeah. But most interesting to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Jacketing. Uh, yeah. Some of the edges are picking up some dirt, but that's fine. This jacket's not going to win any beauty contest, but it'll get the fossil safely back to the laboratory. And it'll protect it there for as long as it waits to be, uh, to be opened by a preparator. Tegan, were you talking about uh, volunteering in the lab and doing some prep? Yeah. Nice. You might be opening some of these jackets. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Can't get much cooler than like a brand new dinosaur. Oh yeah, that's fine. Not yet named. <laughs> There's no brachiopods. That's what's cool. <laughs> Yeah, I think as long as Don doesn't object to that. <laughs> I wonder if Don has any uh, yeah. watching TV. <laughs> oh, we were just listening to the radio or something. Oh, no, yeah, music, no, no, no. podcast. When I, when, yeah, whenever I watch stuff, it's always playing video games at the same time, so I'm not actually watching it. But mm. just it's kind of like background noise. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll get lost in my thoughts. You get distracted. I, I, yeah. I, can, I can do that. You gotta understand, Don. He doesn't. Go to movies to watch TV. <laughs> so Don doesn't like participate in society or have fun. <laughs> Only sports. <laughs> he watches sports. Uh, okay. And you know, participates in sports too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is Don yeah. still on the stream? I don't know. Uh, probably <laughs> Make not. Make sure we're not trashing him. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a fact. I'm proud of it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good. I don't like he's got a problem with the fact that he thinks that most normal human endeavors are trivial and... <laughs> <laughs> you might have a point there. Uh. He's so nice, though. At least he's always been so nice to you. Oh, Don's great. I see all this with respect and love. Yeah. If we didn't like Don, we would <laughs> not be needling him a little bit. Back. Exactly, yeah. 
<laughs> and you're constantly being made fun of someone else. <laughs> Oh, and I forgot to take my watch off. Darn. That plaster all over my watch band for weeks now. Oh, no. That's okay. Just toss it in with the fossil and someone will prep it out. Yeah. For a little while. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get back some, some undisclosed amount of time. Tegan just wants to find it later. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, how expensive is that watch? <laughs> Not very, but it is a fossil watch, so. Yeah. I guess, I guess that counts. <laughs> really going to dry out the leather on this. That's okay. Uh. All right. There you go, chat. Completed jacket. Beautiful. Applause now. Yeah. <laughs> It's not the prettiest on the underside, but that's okay. Yeah. Hide that side from the camera. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Nice. Uh, and GME member says, "Do you really believe in din dinosaurs? What are dinosaurs?" Got them. <laughs> um. <laughs> Well, if it's your first time here, like I'm guessing it is, welcome to paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. And do you uh, like dinosaurs? What's that? And do you like dinosaurs? <laughs> yeah. Um, we're digging up dinosaurs here in the quarry. We've got, uh, we have every indication of a new species or maybe new genus of iguanodont dinosaur. And, uh, yeah, we've got, how many bones of this thing do we think we have in the, the lab so far? A thousand. A thousand? Shoot. I mean, awesome. we've, got, we've probably got 12 to 15 individuals minimum yeah. so far. Nice. All different sizes. Uh huh. I mean, we have femurs, complete femurs and stuff this long. Mm hmm. And we have them that long. <laughs> Shoot. So, pretty pretty good sample size here. Yeah. Um, um, material. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we have 15 jaws, probably of different sizes. Holy cow. Yeah, we got a lot of stuff. Huh. What's our official MNI, you think? I don't think we've calculated it precisely, okay. but it's mm -hmm. it's a lot. I yeah. Mean, uh, there's no shortage of this animal. It's going to be a hallmark dinosaur. Yeah. Whenever it gets named, described, and you know there'll be so much material. And, yep. You know, so many dinosaurs are not near, known by nearly this much material. Exciting stuff. Yeah. yeah. Make up fake tales about this dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> something, something really cool to put on the map. <laughs> yeah, it could swim up waterfalls and it could ride a skateboard. <laughs> no, shoot, sorry, that's Spinosaurus. <laughs> the, the skateboard part of the, the, the waterfall part. And it could shoot lasers out of its eyes. Hey. <laughs> 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 Uh, uh, and GME member says, well, thanks, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Welcome to paleontologizing. I'm digging up uh, dinosaurs here with the Utah Geological Survey. There's Utah State Paleontologist Jim Kirkland right there. And, uh, yeah. I know, yeah. <laughs> Gotta remember to moisturize my hands when we get back to camp so they don't completely no, dry out. No, we my guy more. Yeah? A little bit of white vinegar. White vinegar? It neutralizes the alkalinity. Oh. Uh, so a little bit of acid to rinse. Yeah, d real dilute, you know. Uh-huh. But the acid versus the alkali. I'll gotta remember that, yeah. White you vinegar. Like, you'll smell like a, like a nice salad. <laughs> yeah. You, go, you know, yeah. a, a healthy salad. Good stuff. But people that really don't, there are a lot of people that don't like the <laughs> and stuff after using a lot of plastic. Oh, yeah. And that'll just change, stop that the pool. <laughs> Good to know. But some people think that's oh, just I can dig crazy. I've got this and then I've got vinegar and blue vinegar and a bone here. Uh -huh. So I don't want to dig down deeper. Some people think not using gloves in the quarry is crazy. No. <laughs> that's right. 
Which I can understand. No, it's not, they have, I've watched people like brushing stuff uh -huh. through gloves and just their, they, can't, they hit a bit of damp glue. Oh, yeah. Sticks and just rips on the shreds. Ugh. I've seen that more than once. Ugh. You know, and it's like they barely touched it. Yeah. You know, so, I'm, you know, I'm careful. It's just like, <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it's bad enough for your own thing to touch and tack the glue, but yep. you get a fabric you know, into that. Oh, man. Yeah. yeah. Oof, just, well, one thing's for certain, if you're a hand model, you probably don't want to do, you know, vertebrate field paleontology. <laughs> hey, Danny, can you grab me the, the map boards? Uh, yeah, you bet. I know you're you a little bit recording yeah. over here. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see. My jacket from earlier is going to be all ready now for labeling. So I can go ahead and write on that. Yeah. And oatmeal and hot water helps moisturize your skin after using lime, says Sir Yogi Wan. That, that sounds pretty cool too, actually. I just have some, like, hand lotion back in camp. I usually put on after a day of jacketing. But, uh, that does sound pretty good. If you eat the oats afterward too, you know, you get a meal out of it. Yeah. Give everyone oats for breakfast. Uh, since last year, yeah, yeah. Um, and out here I stream seven days a week if I can. Normally when I'm back home in my office, it's just every weekday. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I figure like while I'm in the field, might as well, if I'm working every day, might as well stream every day. Yeah. And where is home? Uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to San Francisco in three weeks. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, shoot, stop by and say hello if you want to. I'm over in Oakland. Oh, awesome. Shoot, that's like just a few miles from my from my house. Yeah. Cool, yeah, you should drop by. Well, if you have any recommendations of things to use, so I haven't done this Oh, definitely. Shoot, yeah, we should talk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, you are? Nice. I've only been to Alcatraz once. I'm like, born and raised in the Bay Area, only been one time. Aquarium of the Bay. Yeah, yeah, right by Pier 39. Cleaned out that whole area in front of you there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's no going to see it between this and the... Did you see all the sea lions over there? Yeah, Pier 39 too? Yeah. 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 Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Hey Fisher, do you have a squirt gun? I do not. Thank you, man. Thank you. There we go. Build him, babies. All right. This dries a little bit better, so the sharpie sticks. Uh, and Miss Capricel, I used to live in the barrier too. Yeah, Albany, Emeryville, downtown SF. Nice. Yeah, I was born and raised in the Bay Area, so that's definitely home for me. Although I lived in Montana for the better part of a decade, and that's where I learned how to dig dinosaurs. But, I don't know. It's good to be home. Uh, when I am home. It's good to be in Utah right now.
answer, Yogi One. I can relate to that. Yeah, I definitely miss the ocean too when I live really far inland. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a trade-off living in the Bay Area. Um, I don't really have any dinosaur fossils nearby, but it's also a lovely place to live. So it's really nice being able to just come out here to Utah and to Wyoming, Montana, and places like that during the summer. Um, do excavations and prospecting and all kinds of field work, and then just go home after work. It's uh, not gonna lie, it's good life. <laughs> I really enjoy it. Uh, 
talking about. No, we don't. We don't want a, an Andusasaurus or a Danny Raptor or anything like that. Because if if a dinosaur gets named that, that probably means that I've like recently died in some tragic way, <laughs> in order to warrant having something named after me. So we do not want that. <laughs> yeah. I'll do it. I personally do not believe that you cannot name a dinosaur after a living person. No, you should be able to, yeah. 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 Uh, Bucky Gates is like, no, you can't do that. Really? Yeah. He's like, no, no, no. no just... Why good, why good is naming one after a dead person? They don't care. <laughs> That's a good point, Jim. I like that. Yeah. Now, my point was that, like, I don't have that kind of stature where anybody's going to name a dinosaur after me. Like, hey, if that's... Never a dinosaur you get a name after you. <laughs> well, I have, yeah. but it's not getting named after me. You name it after each other. Yeah, new species. It's a Chasmosaurian from the Judas. <laughs> And Cast a Dreamer asks, is Jim the expedition leader and the person writing the paper on this one? Um, yeah. I guess Jim is the expedition leader and he will yeah, be an author on this paper, I think. <laughs> yeah. That's actually a good yeah, a good delineator there. If it's your name on the permit, then I guess you are the lead. For now, but uh, I think the lead on research for this is gonna be Karen Poole. <laughs> she works on Iguanodontians. So she's going to be the one leading the charge with the actual, like, the write-up for this. Uh, now bring in experts. They make you look good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm sure Jim's going to be an author on the paper, too. Oh, sir. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Probably done. Probably done? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, I've never really worked on Iguanodonts before, but... I'll hopefully be starting to this fall, which will be cool. But I don't think I'll be an author on this this new critter. Uh, unless I have something to actually contribute, which I doubt I will. Sorry about the camera stuff. Here we go. There we are. Oh, that water feels good. <laughs> I don't think it's going to get named Papa Jimadon, but um, I suppose there's a chance. Fisher's face over here as he works on uh, yeah, so actually Jackie the second nice. transverse process was down here oh nice I nicked it okay. a little bit when I was cutting this down but it's all there okay so. awesome so we've got a nearly complete vertebra well, there. We, missing the centrum so. oh it's missing the centrum yeah. shoot okay all right so it's only missing the main part it's the uh, arch. apart from that it's it's complete more or less so yeah once again like you said you know this is like one of those things repetition leads to learning. Repetition leads to learning. <laughs> so we have uh, Fisher applying some separator here to the underside of that jacket. Do we have blank logs in the brown? Yeah, in the brown The little uh, mini ones? Binder. In the big brown binder. Yeah, I'll get it. 240. You stay there, chat. Sure. 
We're gonna have a hundred out of here soon. We started at what, like 160? Something like that, yeah. Pretty stellar. Wonder what our record is so far for which of the three summers so far we've had the most out? Probably this year. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. By the end, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Is this Corey? I don't know. I think Don and I have got more than that. No, we mean Ethan's wash. We Ethan's wash, so certainly. Nice. says, cook everyone, lean to the left. Uh-oh, what are you trying to do? Oh, shoot! <laughs> uh, I mean, let's go see what Ethan's up to over here, if he doesn't mind. Sweeping dirt. Sweeping dirt? Just a humble dirt farmer, trying to make his way in the world. We've got a bone sticking out right there next to that jacket. Um, what's in that jacket right there? I don't know. Huh. Parts of a vertebrae? Yeah. Yeah, connects into this one. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. It's good that you're able to get those out separate. Yeah. Um, don't really know what it is, though. <laughs> There's a mystery, a new bone right here, but it's probably not really visible on oh, the camera. Okay. Um, where is Ethan. it? There it is. Nice. Ethan, you're supposed to put estimates of size, scale bar. You know, 10 centimeters across, 3 feet, 1 yeah. feet. Oh, I've not inches. been doing that the whole Yeah, you're really supposed to do that. That's always been our policy. Oh, oh okay, sure. Oh, sketch, that. put a scale. All right, we'll, we'll do that from now on. I was just yeah. doing what everybody else is doing, you know? Yeah, I didn't know. Was, I mean, I'm sure if. Yeah. It's a we'll good thing nobody decided to jump off a bridge right at the moment. Look at them all, dude. Is this like, is it little? Is it big? Is it, is it, is it... Well, the length uh, on the edge. Should help too, like the length of it on the map, the easting and the right, northern. It's usually just looking at the list stuff, you know, you're usually not referring to everything when you're dropping it. Anyway, just duplication of information in case it's nuclear blast. Yeah. yeah, let's go walk around for a little bit because I don't really have anything to do at the moment, having finished that jacketing and mapping and everything else. And we're probably going to be wrapping up here pretty soon. So uh, let's just do some quality time Q&A, shall we? Uh, I definitely am. Uh, Fisher might need a few more minutes, though. No, I'm pretty much done. Oh, nice. Okay. Beautiful. I'm approaching my beautiful jacket. A little inside joke there. Um, but yeah, if anybody's got any questions, now is the time. I'm trying to be attentive to chat at the moment. Uh, Afro Bennett girl, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Disney Queen, good to see you too. Uh, Matt Image says, this is a very cool dig. Thank you. I'm glad that people aren't disappointed in saying this, you know? Because I almost feel like Jurassic Park kind of ruined that for everybody. Not seeing living dinosaurs, you know, but rather the dig site scene from Jurassic Park where you've just got this beautiful Deinonychus skeleton just complete and articulated, just in like beautiful epistatonic posture and they're just brushing little bits of sand away from it with soft brushes. That's not the way that it really works in real life. Um, so I'm glad that, that this isn't too much of a shock. It's not too much of a disappointment seeing how it's really done. You know, I'm glad you still think this is cool because it's real, you know? Let me put the shoulder strap on. Uh, there we go. Ah, oh, that breeze feels nice. Even a 97 degree breeze, still better than no breeze. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Missed the answer. Oop. From Zithras, how easy is it to visually separate the fossil bone edges from the surrounding rock? From this far away, it all looks like rock. Up close, it does, it is easier to distinguish, but you'd also develop an eye for that after years of experience, you know? Like, it's easier to tell the bone and the rock apart. In certain quarries, in certain depositional settings, in certain lithologies, the bone and the rocks are like night and day difference. Here, it's a little bit trickier. 
Uh, but yeah, that's part of what we're doing as we're digging, is we're trying to figure out the outline of the bone. And then once we've get, got that outline figured out, we take a step back and we say, okay, we've got enough of it exposed. We don't want to go in any further and damage it. And then you put your, you start jacketing it. You put your top jacket over and then uh, you can trench around that jacket and then eventually you flip it and uh, you collect it. Uh, and let's see. And is this dig in the desert, says uh, GD of War. What do you think? <laughs> is this enough desert for you? Yeah, we are certainly in the high desert of eastern Utah right now. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty dry out here. You know, the most lush and vibrant plants you get look like this. You know, how's that for foliage? Like salt bush there. Yeah. And, uh... Mox LSS is our dinosaur fossils ever found in wooded areas. I've not seen much, but what I have seen, it always, always, it almost always looks like digging takes place in a desert. That is kind of the, the archetype, you know? Um, when we find fossils, it's generally through prospecting. You walk around, you look at the ground, you look for fossils that are starting to be exposed. The best place to do, place to do that was where there's a lot of exposed rock like this. Not a lot of vegetation covering it. Um, and so, yeah, desert environments are often the best for that kind of thing. Although occasionally there are fossils that are found in the woods. Um, yeah, it does happen. There are fossils that are occasionally found in rainforests and stuff. It's just not nearly as likely, you know? Um, yeah, you're going to find more fossils more easily in a place where they're not obscured by trees, vines parking lots, Walmarts, Tesco's, etc. Uh, yeah. And let's see. Do you ever lose some of the bone that way? W what way, Dan, the BC man? Hopefully we don't lose any. That's the whole thing. And, uh, yeah. And Manfred, uh, says, what are you digging at right now? An Iguanodontian dinosaur. So, uh, uh, a kind of four-legged plant-eating dinosaur with a beak. Like a duck-billed dinosaur, but earlier in time. Uh, yeah, from the very, very beginning of the Cretaceous period. So, these rocks that we're digging in here are about 142 million years old. The very, very beginning of the Cretaceous. And do you ever use a machine to flip large fossils? Or I guess just leverage, but with what? Semi-14, good question. Sometimes we do use tools to, to flip, especially large jackets. Um, you might use like a pry bar or something like that. Uh, I've used crowbars on jackets that are heavy but not particularly big. But normally it's just, you know, it's just human power, just muscle. That's, uh, that's generally how we do it. Yeah. Uh, and it looks like they're getting ready to wrap up down there, so I should probably wrap up the stream pretty soon here. Yeah. Let's see, scrolling through chat. And Mox says, thanks for all your answers. You bet. Thanks for the questions. Uh, and how did you choose this fossil location? Is it by map? So this one was discovered about 20 years ago by Jim Kirkland and Don DeBlue and Scott Madsen. Uh, they were out surveying this area looking for fossils, and they happen to find some right on the valley floor, which is unusual. Normally you find it along the slope, along like the side of a hill or, you know, side of a canyon or something like that. It's unusual to find it down in the flat part of the valley. Relatively flat. But yeah, yeah, turns out this whole valley floor is just, most of this is just one gigantic dinosaur site. There's dinosaur fossils everywhere in here. This is an area that really should be protected. It should become like a national fossil beds kind of area, something like that. Because there are just unfathomable number, numbers of dinosaurs buried right here. It's pretty cool. We're pretty lucky to be here. Yeah. Is there a chance we could see a lab work stream during off season? Not fixing? We're gonna try and do that. We'll see. No guarantees, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best. Yeah. But yeah. Flood event. So no, the dinosaurs here were deposited over thousands upon thousands of years 
you know, while they were walking around, like, while during the age of dinosaurs. This was, like, you know, multiple decades, multiple centuries, probably multiple millennia, uh, 142 million years ago, these fossils were laid down um, in kind of a swampy, wet, marshy kind of environment. Uh, not like a single flooding event or anything like that. Not even, like, seasonal flooding. Probably just, you know, accruing bones over a long, long, long time in this fetid swamp. Yeah. Anyway, hope that makes sense. And, yeah, okay. We're starting the, the teardown, so let's go ahead and wrap up this stream, and then I can go help out with that. So uh, let's see who else is on Twitch right now that we can raid into. Who else is live? Let's see. Who was Lab? Hoot House. Astro Canuck. Um, let's go right into Astro Canuck, shall we? That'll be cool. Uh, he's doing some Lego stuff, but he also does science communication here on Twitch. Let's go check him out. Go back to my channel. And... Raid Astro Canuck. Beautiful. All right. Well, thank you, thank you, everybody, for uh, helping make this stream a good one. I appreciate your questions. I appreciate your attention and your viewership. I appreciate your curiosity and your, you know, just general good vibes, your kind words. All that stuff is important to me. And your financial support is what makes this possible in the first place. So thank you for that, for helping pay the bills for the satellite internet and all that good stuff. Um, tomorrow, I will not be streaming from the quarry. At least I don't think so. Uh, we're going to be taking a quick little trip over to Colorado. And uh, I'm going to be doing a stream from the workshop of Rob Gaston, who does molding and casting of uh, dinosaur and other fossil critters. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Really excited about that. He's one of the best in the world at uh, molding and casting and mounting dinosaur skeletons. Chances are you've seen some of his work in museums. And we're getting a personal tour of his workshop tomorrow. I'm very, very excited. We're going to learn a whole lot. It's going to be super awesome, so don't miss it. But until then, everybody, you take care of yourselves. And uh, yeah, he is the guy for whom Gastonia is named. The dinosaur Gastonia is named after Rob Gaston. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So tune in then. I'll see everybody tomorrow. You take care of yourselves. Let's go right into Astro Canuck. I'll see you there.